for those of you that are uh, coming back into the room, this is going to be the, uh, the Thomas More session two. Really, really excited. We've got documentary trailer. In just a few minutes, we'll start off the session with that. So with, with that, um, my suggestion to Thomas More is that we give it about a minute or so, uh, maybe just do some soft introductions, Lauren, and then, um, and then, we'll, and then you, you let me know when you're ready to queue up the video and I'll start it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I wanted to give these gentlemen a proper introduction. So I got a couple of notes here because I want y'all to know just these powerhouses that are going to be sharing with you this hour. Um, do we want to go ahead and wait and ensure that Eric is on the line? I think we're waiting on, we've got Tom, we've got Andy, we've got Peter, and I think we're waiting on Eric Scheidler, right? We're waiting on Eric. Um, okay. But if you want, we can go ahead and get rolling. So. Sure. And, uh, yeah, and, and Peter, if you're in, you just need to turn your camera on. It's the little button to the left of your microphone. There we go. And as a reminder to our speakers, if at any time you cannot hear or see, just refresh your screen. And as a reminder to our guests, in, in the event uh, they crash, I don't know if they're slowing down our bandwidth, but we'll get through it. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Lauren. Thank you so much. Very good. Well, I just want to welcome all of you once again to the second hour of the Law of Life Summit. Uh, if you're just joining us for the first time, the super popular annual annual event normally takes place in Washington, D.C., the day before the March for Life. But of course, uh, this year being the unique year that it is, uh, we joined the March for Life and going virtual. Of course, the blessing, is, as Roy so aptly put at the beginning of the event, is that many of you are able to join us for the first time ever. So exciting. So it's my great privilege to be emceeing the second hour. Uh, one once again, I'm Laura Muzica, the executive director of Sidewalk Advocates for Life. I happen to be an attorney myself who I always say, by God's grace, ended up in grassroots pro-life work. I've got smarter people than me fighting on the law front. <laughs> I'm also a 2009 Ave Maria School of Law graduate like Royce. Uh, and this is what we're calling the pro-life legal power hour. Uh, we all know that it's important to fight abortion peacefully and prayerfully on both levels of law and culture. So last hour, you got a taste of how pro-life leaders are changing the cultural landscape. And this hour, we're going to give you a taste of how attorneys who champion our cause are fighting for your First Amendment rights and more. And there's really no one doing that better than the attorneys with the Thomas More Society. They are a not-for-profit not a national public interest law firm dedicated to restoring respect in law for life, family, and religious liberty. They defend and foster support for these causes by providing high quality pro bono, that means free folks, pro bono legal ser services from local trial courts all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. And as we go here, I invite you to pay attention to the chat box on your screen. So feel free to share a thought, ask a question, and we're going to work that in as we can. Now, in the unfortunate instance that maybe my computer screen freezes, Andy, feel free to take over for me wherever I left off. But uh, real quick, I want to do a little bit of a roll call, let you know the powerhouses that are with you this hour. We're joined today by President and Founder and Chief Counsel Tom Brecca. Give us a wave, Tom. Hello. <laughs> Awesome. Executive Vice President and General Counsel Andy Bath. Welcome, Andy. Good to see you. Vice Good to be President. Here. Awesome. Great to have you. Vice President and Senior Counsel, the Honorable Peter Breen. Welcome, Peter. Good to see you. Hey, awesome. And then here in a little bit, the Executive Director of Pro Life Action League, Eric Scheidler, one of their top clients and really co founders, uh, will be joining us here very soon. So, this hour, here's what we're going to feature. We're going to give a preview of the Now v. Scheidler documentary, reflecting on how this case forever impacted the landscape of peaceful pro-life activism. This very much impacts what I do day to day, leading the largest sidewalk counseling organization around the globe. So grateful to the Scheidlers and to the Tess Moore Society for the foundation that they laid so we can even do this activity day to day and help save lives and end abortion on the community level. We're gonna have a, a time of tribute to Joe Scheidler, lovingly known as the godfather of pro-life activism. Uh, that friend and hero who went home to the Lord on Martin Luther King Jr. Day. What a day to go home and have some time to reflect on his legacy. Uh, then I'm going to pass the baton to Andy. He's going to talk about the work of Thomas More Society pending cases around the United States, how that affects you. Uh, then we're going to have Peter Breen give us an update on the David Delayden case. Uh, 
For those of you who are not familiar with David's work, he's the valiant undercover investigative journalist who exposed the Planned Parenthood baby body parts scandal. And then at the bottom of the hour, we're going to switch things up, bring on a couple of new faces. Uh, we'll have a couple other Thomas More Society attorneys addressing church closures during the COVID-19 pandemic and cap it off with a what to expect uh, in regards to the recent change of administration. So uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and get rolling. We expect Eric Scheidler, uh, Eric Scheidler to join us here momentarily. But a lot of people, uh, gentlemen, don't realize that the Thomas More Society was really forged out of necessity in the late 90s to continue defending the historic Now v. Scheidler case. And if you're not familiar with that case, if you're not a nerdy attorney like I am and fascinated by what happened with that case, this was a nationwide class action lawsuit brought by the National Organization for Women. I hate even saying that. That's an insult to me as a woman. But anyways, they brought this against Joe Scheidler, among others. And it was clearly a, a transparent attempt to gag peaceful pro-life activism at abortion facility, uh, abortion facilities across the nation. And what a lot of people don't realize is that without Tom, without the Thomas More Society, without Joe and Ann and the Pro-Life Action League, their sacrifices, their perseverance, peace, peaceful pro-life activism may have largely been banned across the nation. So we're going to talk more about that here in just a second. Uh, but Royce, I think you've got it queued up. Since 1920, we have aborted one billion children across the world in 100 years. I thought I had to fight that. That will destroy our country. He got a name for himself in the movement and began to be in great demand speaking around the world. Frankly, what he did was a textbook case on how to organize a protest movement. I was sued by the National Organization for Women on a charge of racketeering. When the Nalvi Scheider case came along, I filed my appearance, and before long, I was the lead counsel for the defense. They were convinced that they had found the silver bullet to getting rid of the pro-life movement. It was really important to us that we come out victorious and be able to assure people, yes, you can still come out and do protests. You can still go out to the abortion clinics and sidewalk council. The Now v. Scheidler case is important because without their perseverance, so many organizations that hold vigil outside of abortion facilities wouldn't exist. And that impacts generations. Did I ever think that involvement with this case would last 28 years? <laughs> and go before the U.S. Supreme Court not only once, not only twice, but three times? Inconceivable. Amazing. Um, and our apologies. Uh, you may have heard a little bit of feedback there, but I think you got the gist of it. I know that when I watched this trailer earlier today, I had tears in my eyes uh, seeing the face again of the godfather of peaceful pro-life activism. Um, so amazing. So uh, let's see here. Do we have Eric with us or? I am here if you can hear me. Oh, very hey. good. Good to, good to hear you, Eric. Yeah, um, I'm not sure why you're not seeing me, but. Eric, to the left of your microphone, there's a little blue button, a little button to the left of the microphone button. Hit that and that'll turn your camera on. And then Peter Breen will want to do the same thing when he's back. Am I special guest four or special guest three or what? <laughs> there I am. Oh, and you're in there. You're a special oh. guest. There you go. All right. Awesome. Okay. And Peter, whenever you're ready to show your face, no problem. Uh, I know we're going to bring you in oh. here in just a little bit. So let me go ahead and start here with Tom. And then I want to bring Eric into this discussion really quickly. Um, I don't know if the pro-life world can understand just how important this case was for the future of peaceful pro-life activism and the sacrifices that the Scheidler family made, Pro-Life Action League. You know, I've read uh, half now of uh, Joe Scheidler's memoir, uh, Racketeer for Life, and, and there's a lot in that book about this monumental case. Um, you all did so much to ensure that our rights were secured. So can you, um, you know, especially for the non 
nerdy lawyers out there. <laughs> Can you give us a, a little bit of a concise summary of what this case was and why it was so important to the pro-life movement, Tom? Well, let me try, Lauren. I Concise, I'm not sure. <laughs> it, went on, <laughs> it went on for uh, 28 years, uh, as was said in that trailer. I don't know if you, everybody could hear it. Uh, why did it go on so long? Well, it has a lot to do with the culture and the place of abortion in the culture and our regard for life, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, not being as strong as it uh, always was. My gosh, it's written into the Declaration of Independence. And yet, uh, somehow, uh, because the Supreme Court in 1973, uh, Roe v. Wade and Doe v. Bolton, uh, went uh, off the rails, uh, the other side was saying, well, this is a constitutional right and therefore, you can't be against it. Uh, this is civil rights, and uh, it's settled. Well, it wasn't settled, and <laughs> heaven, no. And you know, Joe Scheider, uh, whom I uh, got to defend here, what an honor. Uh, although it was a difficult task, uh, a challenging task. Uh, it started as an antitrust case, and uh, then they added RICO or racketeering charges. And, uh, you know, they were saying that really uh, uh, to stand in front of an abortion clinic, even to kneel and pray, uh, was intimidating and a uh, cause of fear and used terrible words like terrorism. Uh, and uh, uh, what Joe Scheider did was stand up in the face of this and say, my goodness, it's our fundamental core belief that life is sacred. And uh, heavens, we need to speak out that truth and uh, bear witness to it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so they said, well, he was trying to shut down the industry and that was a antitrust violation. Well, that's ridiculous. And yet it took us five years to get the court to dismiss that claim. Uh, the dismissal was upheld, but then uh, they also added this racketeering charge. Yeah, and that's why calling Joe a godfather was kind of iron, ironic because, of course, uh, he was anything but a racketeer. Racketeers are people who kill for money. Ugh. He was against that uh, and vociferously and actively. And that was his thrust. Uh, and, uh, you know, why did it take three trips to the Supreme Court? Well, <laughs> we used a theory that prevailed. Uh, as I say, five years into it, and yet uh, uh, an on appeal it prevailed, except that the Supreme Court uh, didn't like that legal theory that we used. Uh, and uh, so mm -hmm. they sent us back down for trial. It went uh, to a long trial, and uh, we appealed again. We lost on appeal, but then the Supreme Court in April 2002, hallelujah, took our appeal. And we won decisively eight to one. We had support from Martin Luther King's group, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, all kinds of protest groups, uh, because in effect, what uh, peaceable protest is, a, uh, you know, as American as apple pie, uh, and although it's often uh, suppressed uh, as it was, uh, at least they tried to suppress it here and the court uh, uh, stood with us, and uh, we went back down to the lower courts. But guess what? They tried to overrule the Supreme Court <laughs> only wow. in the abortion case. Uh, they did it on a gambit. They wouldn't take the case a third time. They lost the gambit. They took it a third time, and we won then unanimously. Thank wow. God. Heavens, praise God. And, uh, you know, but the fight goes on. Now they're using racketeering uh, charges again against uh, young David Delighton, an undercover <laughs> activist out in California. So unbelievable. Wow. And I, I just want everyone to take a moment and realize what a huge victory uh, this was for the movement, um, for what I do day to day. I can't imagine what peaceful prayer, sidewalk counseling, you know, uh, peaceful protest would have looked like today had this uh, case not have been won. Um, Eric, I want to bring you into the conversation. Thanks for joining us today. You know, no, you and your family have been through a lot. Our deepest, uh, deepest condolences to you and your family with the recent loss of your father. Um, you grew up on the front lines with your dad. 
Uh, we would love to hear from you about uh, what your father's example meant to you and looking back, uh, just how important this case was for the pro-life movement and all the work that he did. Well, you know, I'd like to share a story from even before the lawsuit. I was a much younger child at this time, but I think it illustrates who my dad was. We were outside American Women's Medical Center in Chicago, one of the most notorious abortion clinics in the city, a real shabby place, and uh, one that we've been ministering at for, for, for years and years and years. And we were out there, I was maybe you know 12 or 13 years old, and there was a woman walking across the street, and I called out something like, you know, murderer, don't murder your baby, or something like this. And my dad took me to the side, and he said, Eric, we never talk to a, a woman entering an abortion clinic like that. You don't want to cry out murder because you'll never get her to come and talk to you if you talk in those terms. We need to reach out with compassion and concern and let her know that we love her. Um, that was how passionate he was and how much as Father Simon, Father uh, Richard Simon said it during his funeral homily, that my father was motivated by love. He, you know, he really loved unborn children. He, he's always had a very tender heart for children in general. Um, but even at a protest, he, he took a moment to talk to a, a dumb kid who was saying the wrong thing. You know, he told me the right way to approach it. And I never, ever forgot that advice that he gave me. That's one of many pieces of, of advice on how to be an effective pro-lifer that I remember over the years. And that was the man that they were going after with these RICO lawsuits, uh, with, with Now versus Scheidler and, and its many iterations. Um, but the reality was that my father was organizing pro-lifers across the country to turn that passion for life, that compassion for women, that tenderness and love for unborn children into direct action to save lives from abortion. And he was so effective and his colleagues and friends were so effective that they went after him as if he was some kind of a mobster for uh, extorting for extorting women from their right to an abortion. For the Scheidler family personally, now versus Scheidler is almost the backdrop for for our lives. My, my younger siblings were still in grade school and high school at the time, and they had to face the possibility of losing their family home as we had to uh, put that house up uh, for our bond in order to be able to make an appeal that uh, Tom Brecka and the Thomas More Society so valiantly and so victoriously pursued. So here we were um, worrying that we might lose our family home. Um, and, and I was I was in college and on into grad school and then into having a fam my family as this case was going on. And it was it was always there, this worry that my father would be ruined um, financially and, and just not able to ever do pro-life work again if they had been victorious. And something I've been saying to uh, to pro-lifers and others I've been speaking to over the, the last uh, 10 days since my dad passed mm -hmm. away is that, you know, of course, the pro-life movement is incredibly grateful to Joe Scheidler. I mean. Um, I can't tell you how grateful I personally am for his leadership. And so many have shared their appreciation with that with me and my family over the past uh, two weeks. But the United States of America as a whole owes a debt of gratitude to Joe Scheidler and, and Andy Schulberg and Tim Murphy and the pro-life action league and the other defendants in that case, because in refusing to settle, in refusing to back down, in insisting on achieving justice in this case, he secured the rights of all Americans going forward not to have their action in, in service of the social justice cause, some issue that they care about, their expression of their freedom of speech and of assembly, to have those actions attacked in this horrible way, to make them a federal crime with triple damages. The Supreme Court justices could see that this was a terribly dangerous precedent. Even Ruth Bader Ginsburg recognized that this case was uh, would be incredibly dangerous for the American tradition of freedom of speech. And how that freedom upholds our democracy through the centuries. So, you know, Joe Scheidler is a pro-life hero, but he's also an American hero. Mm, I love that. That's so perfect. And I really hope people hear that. Uh, what this did for our First Amendment freedoms and what this did for pro-life activism going forward. Uh, I always say in the younger generation here, I stand on the shoulders of giants. And Eric, your dad is was one of my biggest inspirations in getting into full-time pro-life work. I've heard countless stories over the last couple of weeks with other people who share that very sentiment. Um, so thank you and everything that you all uh, are doing. Um, I know that uh, you all have a legacy webcast coming up and what you're reflecting on um, 
you know, how your dad has really uh, laid a foundation for those of us to, to carry this message forward. Uh, can you give us details about how people can participate in that webcast coming up? Absolutely. We're very excited that so many people have come forward to share their testimonials and we just want to keep spreading the word. You know, um, it's an incredibly sad thing that my dad passed away. I spent yesterday evening with a brother, my brother Peter, who gave his eulogy, one of the two eulogies for him at the funeral and who was there with him as soon as he started to, to become uh, frail and, and need help uh, on Sunday the 18th or Sunday the 17th. And um, and it was an incredibly, incredibly moving thing for us as a family, but incredibly moving for so many other people. And I'm so grateful that, that there's been such an outpouring. And I want to share that story with more and more people. You know, that it's a sad thing when someone dies, but it's also a powerful moment when their whole life can be seen, can be appreciated, can be celebrated, and then built upon. And, and so we are holding a tribute to Joe Scheidler's Life and Legacy webcast on February 3rd at 9 p.m. Eastern time. You can sign up for that at prolifeaction.org. If you go to prolifeaction.org, there'll be a pop-up window. Um, if you want to go directly to the page, it's slash tribute, prolifeaction.org slash tribute. You can find it on our Facebook page and other places. Uh, register there. You will be able to participate in the live webcast um, to watch the replay if that works better for you and to see tributes and testimonials from pro-life leaders all over the world talking about how Joe Scheidler inspired them and, and how he should inspire all of us to complete his mission. Mm. Deepest, yeah. deepest hope was that this direct pro-life work would continue after he passed away. Uh, yeah. he was, obviously, he was very grateful to have his son stepping in to help with the pro-life action league. But guys, I can't do it alone. How could I possibly fill the shoes of Joe Scheidler all by myself? I can't do it. I need your help. I need the help of people like Tom Bracken and Andy Bath and Laura Music and all those people who are, are talking today. I need the help of all of the pro life leaders across the country, all the rank and file folks, everyone who has any kind of a heart for this movement and feels inspired by hearing about a man like Joe who put his life on hold for 50 years to fight abortion. Yeah, it's so good. Gosh, what can we do? What can, yeah. we, what can we do to build on that? Art? I think it would be an amazing thing. So I really yeah. look forward to, to sharing his story, to hearing from so many of those leaders and, and being a part of it. Go to prolifeaction.org to sign up, share it with your friends, put it on social media, and let's let's build a massive, massive remembrance of Joe Scheider that can just catapult the entire pro-life movement into the future. Yeah, so grateful for the next generation of pro-life leaders that he raised up and such an honor to... Uh, Remember him. He's, again, one of my greatest inspirations. And I'm hearing from so many of us in the younger generation where they're sharing, again, the same the same heart. So thanks for being with us, Eric. Feel free to hang on if you want to chime in on something uh, here in the future. Uh, yeah. Something you said I want to jump on, Lauren. Yeah. Um, you said you're you're in one of the new generation. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this. I'm a Generation X guy. I was born in 66. My Gen X baby picture that looked like an abortion picture my dad saw in 1972 is what inspired him to get involved. Generation X was the first generation that was slaughtered by illegal abortion in the United States. Mm. We were slaughtered by they, they were slaughtered by baby boomers and, and silent generation women and men. All right, so so we've had the, the Generation X has been aborted, the millennials have been aborted, now the Zoomers are being aborted. My father belonged to what's called the silent generation in between World War II and the baby boom. We've had silent generation pro-life leaders. We've had baby boomer pro-life leaders. We've had Gen X pro-life leaders like me. Uh, we've had millennial leaders in, in the pro-life movement. Lauren, I'm not sure if you're a millennial or, or very- I'm an old, old millennial. <laughs> old millennial. <laughs> I'm an old millennial. Yeah, there you go. My kids are Zoomers and they're out on our staff with us during the summer. So yeah. many generations are, are, are fighting abortion together. Yeah. This, this veteran leader's legacy, the, grandfather of so many actual grandchildren, the godfather movement. We have so much to learn from him. Yeah, let's, let's do it. So good. Thank you, Eric. All right. Well, we've got about five minutes left in this pod before we need to switch out and invite a couple more TMS attorneys to join us and uh, talk about some of those church closures and all of that. Uh, let me go ahead and pass the baton here to Andy Bath, uh, the vice president at Thomas More Society, general counsel as well. Um, Andy, can you take just a minute, a uh, couple minutes to summarize uh, some of the pending cases that the Thomas More Society has and what that means for all of us. 
Yeah, I want to get to the cases, Lauren, but I want to talk about Tom Brecka and his legacy. Uh, Tom won a, won a a huge case for the movement with brilliant law, lawyering, self-sacrifice, and courage. And people have to understand he took a big risk when he left his firm to start the Thomas More Society. He was all alone and donated off the case in a dilapidated building in downtown Chicago so he could walk to the courthouse. But he had an expansive vision for the future. And today, the Thomas More Society has multiple offices in multiple cities with dozens of lawyers working to support the work of much of the pro-life movement. So when Eric says he needs help, the Thomas More Society is going to be there. Uh, those of you who were at the summit in Washington last year will remember that I told you that we had 54 cases open at the end of the year 2014. And by the end of 2018, that list had grown to 84 cases, an increase of 30 cases in four years. And last year, I told you that by the end of 2019, that number had grown to 121 open cases, an increase of 37 cases in just one year. And now another year later, I'm here to tell you that our list has grown to, now get this, 177 cases. That's an increase of 56 cases in one year. Wow. This is what Tom has created. Um, you know, we're handling the cases all at the same time in courtrooms spread all across the country and literally from coast to coast. Uh, things are going to pick up more. We're faced with a new administration in Washington that's very hostile to the pro-life movement. So, so you have about cases. Uh, Amazing. Uh, one lawyer and one lawsuit. Tom has built the Thomas More Society to the point where we're now, at the same time, we are now faced off in court against opponents like the state of New York, the state of California, the state of Illinois, the state of New Jersey, and organizations like the National Abortion Federation, and even the evil empire itself, Planned Parenthood. Huh. They are represented by some of the biggest law firms in the, in the world, and they have virtually unlimited resources. And Tom has built, founded and built an organization that can stand and go toe to toe with the biggest law firms in the world. Um, and if you want to learn more about his legacy, please go to our website, www.thomasmoresociety.org, and more has one O. Uh, you can read about our work there, sign up for our email updates, you can follow our work, and please pray for us and for our clients. Amazing. Thank you for that, Andy. So Thank good. You, yeah, from one case to I believe it was 177 uh, being handled by the Thomas More Society. Amazing. Uh, one of those cases is the David Delyden case. So I'm going to bring in the Honorable Peter Breen to go ahead and give us an update on what's going on in that case. And and Peter, if you don't mind backing up just a little bit for those who are not familiar with David, who he is, what he did. Uh, and why you're even defending him. If you can take just a minute, so a couple minutes total uh, to bring us up to speed, that would be great. Sure, if you remember in 2015, uh, the blockbuster undercover videos from uh, about Planned Parenthood selling baby parts hit, hit the public in, in July. Congressional investigations followed. Uh, presidential campaigns were impacted. Uh, the whole country was, was uh, just outraged over uh, what they had seen on these videos. So David, uh, and that was the culmination of a 30 month undercover investigation that a then 23 year old David Delayden had conceived of, put together on a shoestring budget, and then over those 30 months executed. You know, David is, uh, that, then that was over five years ago. Uh, that has become uh, this generation's now V. Scheidler. Uh, it is not just one lawsuit, though. It is now uh, at least five, uh, so or six, depending on the day. Uh, yeah. Since the time of the publication of the videos, Planned Parenthood did the thing that we didn't think they would do. They decided to bring David to court. Uh, you know, we thought they wouldn't sue us because we thought they wouldn't want to open themselves up for discovery on this. But uh, as as folks who are following this may know, uh, they had a pretty friendly uh, trial court. Uh, that has held it, held us back from discovery. And so when we were last with you in the Law of Life Summit, uh, we had just come off of a very tough jury verdict in San Francisco in the federal court. Well, what we're looking at now is really uh, the stakes have now been increased. Uh, you know, the final judgment's been entered by Planned Parenthood against us, 2.4 million in damages, and 13.6 million now in attorney's fees and costs for their exceptionally high priced DC lawyers, uh, actually DC, New York and West Coast lawyers. Uh, so from that perspective, 
coming up this year, we've got pretty much the it's this is the critical year in the Daleiden series of lawsuits. Planned Parenthood, we're in briefing right now on that appeal. You know, we we had really we you know we had high hopes that we would be able to win that case, uh, but we knew, you know, just from our experience in the past, that once that case got going, we were going to have a tough time in the trial court just because of the way that uh, the decisions were going. Uh, and so we are looking for help from the Ninth Circuit. You know, that that uh, that circuit was a little bit tougher for us about five years ago when we first started this litigation. Now, uh, President Trump, uh, former President Trump nominated a good chunk of the uh, the judges on that circuit. So it is now evenly balanced. Uh, so we are we're very hopeful that we will get a good result there, be able to reverse some of the very, very uh, poor uh, decisions that were made in the trial court against the First Amendment. Uh, and otherwise, I imagine this, a $16 million judgment against an ordinary citizen, a group of ordinary citizens, would absolutely shut down undercover journalism. It would really chill citizen journalism altogether uh, if it's allowed to stand. In fact, even your mainstream media outlets that you rely on for them to go undercover and look into dirty politicians or bad medical providers or whatever, even they would probably look twice or stop because they've got high priced lawyers who are looking at it going, well, we don't want to we don't want to get sued for millions of dollars. Even if you uncover wrongdoing, you could still be put out of business. And so that is the message that's coming through in this case. And it's why it's so important. Again, briefing this year and possibly oral argument in the Ninth Circuit towards the end of the year. You know, a companion case to that was the National Abortion Federation, as folks may have remembered that that same district court, the trial court, enjoined David's videos of the 2014 and 2015 National Abortion Federation conferences. Those videos have just incredible content, a, a disgusting, terrible content that is of incredible public value uh, that's been used by Congress and other entities to make criminal referrals against Planned Parenthood and other abortion providers. But you, the public, have not been able to see the video. I know about it. I know some of the, the terrible things. I just can't tell you about it because of a federal injunction. We are, that is coming to a head next month. We're arguing wow. the summary judgment in that case next month as well. A big one, a decade in San Quentin. Uh, after these civil lawsuits, Kamala Harris, now the vice president, and Javier Becerra, currently the California attorney general, soon to be your HHS secretary, prosecuted David. And wow. they have multiple felony counts under California law. Again, a decade in San Quentin is what is at risk. We are planning on going to trial in that case later this year against the full weight of the state of California, our largest state in the union. We've got a great team on that, but it is going to be a, a just a battle royal in San Francisco in the Superior Court later this year. You know, as well, I do want to let you know we're counterattacking. We've brought a federal civil rights lawsuit against Kamala Harris, against the sitting vice president of the United States, against huh. Javier Becerra uh, and against others who have really uh, perverted the First Amendment. They have done a selective prosecution. They've never sued anyone. They've never prosecuted any other undercover journalist. Even though the, those journalists have taped in much more allegedly private settings than anything David even contemplated. And those journalists didn't find anywhere near uh, the damning information that, uh, that David found. And so we're suing wow. there. We're also suing in New York City uh, for defamation against Planned Parenthood Federation of America which tried to, uh, in court, they were saying, well, you know, we have no problems with the accuracy of the videos. You'll remember, you might've heard in the public, oh, they said the videos were fake. Well, when it came time in court to prove it, they said, no, 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 we don't have any, we're not gonna challenge the accuracy of the videos, the authenticity of the videos, we won't challenge. Well, again, outside of court, they were saying these videos were manufactured, they're fake. Well, mm. we were, we're gonna take them, but we're gonna take them back to court in the belly of the beast, New York City, to try to get to, uh, to, to establish the truth and get pin them down and make them prove that claim because uh, it is absolutely false. Wow. So, man, that is, in a nutshell, what is going on. And, you know, unlike now v. Scheidler, there are, again, five lawsuits and more uh, ancillary lawsuits going on here. Uh, but, uh, but really, this year coming up is the most critical for David Delyden's defense. So please keep him in your prayers. And yeah. again, you can get more updates at thomasmoresociety.org. Awesome. Thank you, Peter. I know uh, as I look at my hero, David Delighton there. I am so uh, encouraged that 
uh, you and the other TMS attorneys are at the helm uh, leading this charge. So thank you for everything that you're doing and we will definitely continue to pray over David and and this and these cases, <laughs> plural cases, right? So very good. All right, well, we've got to move along here. Um, we have uh, uh, someone new who just joined us. We've got Chris Ferreira, special counsel with the Thomas More Society. Uh, welcome, Chris. And my understanding is either we need Tom or Peter to hop off, uh, whoever wants to duke it out and join us for the church uh, side of things. I'll uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Oh, unless, uh, actually, Peter might have hopped off, Tom, if you want to stick with us. Um, Let's see, and we need, uh, Paul is gonna go ahead and log in. So maybe I'll go ahead and give it a minute here. Um, so folks, if you're just now joining us, uh, we are, oh, somebody else just joined the room. Hopefully that's our special guy. <laughs> uh, we'll see if he comes up here. Uh, this is the Pro-Life Legal Power Hour with the Thomas More Society. Uh, these awesome attorneys who are defending your rights, your First Amendment rights and beyond on the front lines. Uh, we have with us uh, the founder of the Thomas More Society, Chief Legal Counsel Tom Brecka, Vice President and General Counsel Andy Bath. Uh, we have Special Counsel Chris Barrera, and then Paul Jonah is also supposed to join us here in just a moment. So uh, I'm getting messages. I'm going to see if Paul is with us. Um, and if not, we can go ahead and, and get rolling here. And then as soon as Paul is with us, we can uh, loop him in. So, um, I, you know, hey, um, yeah, I think. I think uh, I think Paul is there. Paul, just turn your camera on. It's the little uh, button to the left of your microphone. Okay. And I'll, you guys are doing great. Keep it up. And uh, also, I, I want to. Um, this might have been a question for uh, for Peter, but maybe Andy or Tom can answer it. it uh, Pat asked, "Are are you allowed to show videos in court?" Hmm. And I think he was responding to um, what Peter had talked about with the evidence and the gag order and all that. So a question from Pat. I don't know where Pat is from. It's not Pat Castle, I can tell you that. But are we allowed to show videos in court related to Delighton? And I'm going to go off again, and, and hopefully Paul will be back on in a second. Uh, the answer is yes. We did show quite a few of them. And once shown in court, they were, became part of the public record uh, and could be shown elsewhere, and I think have been. A lot of them are on David's website. Uh, CMP Center for Medical Progress dot org, uh, but a great many were suppressed, and we weren't even allowed to show the court. The judge ruled they were irrelevant. <laughs> so, oh gracious! So <laughs> we've, had, we've had a lot of uh, adversity uh, during the course of the case. Uh, it's uh, refreshing. We're now on appeal, uh, as in the Scheider case. Uh, you know. Uh, sometimes judges make mistakes yeah that's and right we take appeals and when we do we take them all the way up to the top as far as we could go so the best part i hope of the Leiden case is uh, remains ahead of us mm. and are we confident we're always confident and hopeful mm -hmm. uh, error is always welcome however as well as legal acumen this is a spiritual as well as a secular uh, and legal battle. Amen. That's what I love about you guys uh, as you are you know, defending the rights of our peaceful sidewalk counselors on the front lines, 40 Days for Life, so many other clients is that um, you begin with the end in mind and that is you, uh, you aim to win at every turn uh, knowing that you're fighting for uh, our most cherished rights, our first uh, liberty. So we really appreciate that. Um, all right, well, let's go ahead and uh, open this discussion here. Um, you know, one of the things that's really on people's minds in the midst of the pandemic is, you know, these various restrictions that always seem to be changing placed on us, depending on the state in which we reside in regards to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but it seems like those restrictions at times have not been even handed, right? We've got restaurants that have been permitted to stay open uh, and then churches at times, which have been ordered uh, to close. Um, so, you know, in regards to our houses of worship and what uh, has taken place, um, Chris, can you, I'm gonna bring you into the discussion here. Can you give us a, a little bit of an overview on what you all have seen and what you're doing to remedy this issue? Well, I'm litigating COVID-19 restrictions, challenging them in three different states, New York, New Jersey, and California. 
And thematically, it's the same in every state. Uh, it's what I would call a pseudo scientific superstition at work, which is that somehow the indoor premises of churches are peculiarly dangerous viral vectors. And then unless you tightly limit attendance indoors for worship or even ban it altogether, there'll be a viral apocalypse. It's really completely ridiculous. There's no data to support these opinions. And what they're doing in the different states uh, is having people with MD after their name file certifications or declarations to the effect that, well, indoor settings are so much more dangerous and indoor settings involving congregate worship, as they call it, are even more dangerous. But they ignore the fact, which the Supreme Court found decisive in the Brooklyn Diocese case, that lots of indoor congregate activity is going on in big box stores, supermarkets, homeless shelters, mass transit vehicles packed with passengers, meat packing plants, factories, and in New Jersey, even in restaurants. So the Supreme Court in Brooklyn Diocese said, we're not persuaded by this pseudoscientific claim. There's something peculiarly dangerous about a house of worship, as opposed to other, other indoor secular activities that are favored under all these COVID-19 regulation regimes. And so it's yeah. the churches have to be treated on the same basis as secular activities. And we litigated a case in California. Father Burford, a society of St. Pius X priest, has five churches in four different counties. We litigated this in state court because, frankly, a lot of the uh, federal results, at least before Brooklyn Diocese, were quite disappointing in their ignorance of basic constitutional principles. And this California judge was not persuaded by California's claim that there will be a viral apocalypse if you allow churches to open. And he said essentially this. He said, you have to treat churches the same way you do essential businesses or critical infrastructure. Those are the businesses and activities California deems essential and allows to operate at 100 percent capacity. And there are even non-essential businesses that operate at 25 percent capacity or 50 percent capacity. So the judge said simply treat churches like essential businesses. There's no evidence that they're any more threatening in terms of the virus than a secular business is. That's on appeal now by the state of California and by San Diego County. They just filed a notice of appeal. But the principle is, is obvious, and I don't understand why a judge looking at the evidence could honestly find that there's serious scientific evidence that churches are peculiarly dangerous. It just isn't any evidence. Nothing. Yeah. Just a yeah. opinion disguised as science. Hmm, unbelievable. Let me ask what I call a Captain Obvious question. Um, <laughs> why is it important that you fight this? Why um, Why are churches as essential, um, just as much if not more than a restaurant? Kind of give us a little bit of that constitutional perspective. Well, this is what I like the most about being special counsel to the Thomas More Society. The attorneys I'm working with, not only within the society's organizational structure, but also the people that they associate with for work, say, in California, like the LaMondry Law Firm, all men of faith. They all have the eternal perspective on things, and so they all realize that divine worship is more essential than secular activities. We're not here to live forever. Mm. We're here in, a way, in the wayfaring state. Our destiny is an eternal destiny. We want to attain eternal beatitude. That's supposed to be the highest good that motivates all men in their worldly activities. Everything should be ordered to the highest good. And the highest good for man on earth is communion with God. Mm, beautiful. That. And so, and so as Justice Gorsuch, Gorsuch said in his concurring opinion of Brooklyn Diocese, it is time, it is past time, he said, to recognize that there is no world in which religion, houses of worship can be closed under color-coded executive edicts while bike shops and liquor stores are open. <laughs> Unbelievable. That is Why? a Captain Obvious point. <laughs> I love it. Captain Obvious question, Captain Obvious point. Uh, another Captain Obvious question, uh, but I'd love to hear your perspective on this. And if any of the other attorneys want to chime in on this, uh, that'd be great. Why have houses of worship seemingly been targeted in the first place? Why why this special treatment about this particular establishment over another? Well, I think the, the origins of what I consider to be a pseudoscientific superstition about houses of worship, the origins of it are rather mysterious. 
it isn't necessary for us to show that there is specific animus toward religion at work here. In other words, we want to get religion, so let's close the houses of worship. It's nice to have that evidence. And in New York, you pretty much did have that evidence because Governor Cuomo said that his cluster action initiative was specifically targeting the ultra-Orthodox community because of its ultra-Orthodox cluster. He considered the, the uh, certain, a certain rate of positivity among Orthodox Jewish communities in Brooklyn, positivity being just a positive PCR test. Nobody's actually sick. He considered that to be a cluster of ultra-Orthodox, which had to be targeted. So he threatened them with the closure of their houses of worship. But that isn't necessary. The Supreme Court has made clear in Brooklyn Diocese and in subsequent cases that the operative principle is simply whether a house of worship is treated less favorably than comparable secular indoor gatherings. So why are they being targeted? I think it's I think at bottom it's a superstition about churches. But I think it got started back in uh, February or March, probably March, with the infamous anecdote about the choir practice in Skagit, Washington where there are, say, 50 people seated inches apart for a two and a half hour choir practice. And then they had a potluck dinner afterwards and some people contracted the virus. And you know how these things are with the Internet. You get the kernel of something going, it becomes viral, and then it becomes, well, you know, a dogma. And the dogma is that somehow when you go into a house of worship, you're entering a dangerous viral zone. The air is teeming with viruses. Everybody's singing and expelling viruses. They portray worship as if it's a religious mosh pit with everybody hugging each other, shouting, laughing, jumping up and down, interacting, as they put it. But really, uh, as we know from being Catholics, if you go to a low mass, you're sitting in pews facing in the same direction. And most of these churches uh, voluntarily, even before this was required, are practicing social distancing, keeping every other pew unoccupied. So it's actually less interactive than a lot of commercial settings and uh, certainly less interactive than a homeless shelter packed with people or a bus or a train packed with passengers. So there's really n no basis for this nonsense about houses of worship. It, yeah. it really is just an unverified, unsubstantiated superstition. Interesting. Yeah. Paul, really good to uh, have you join us. Thanks for being with us. Um, I know you heard a little bit of what Chris said. My understanding is you're also engaged in this fight as well. Um, can you share a little bit from your perspective about what you're doing to ensure that our houses of worship stay open? Sure, my pleasure. Great to be with you all. And um, we were involved in a case that was filed back in May in uh, California, challenging the restrictions out here imposed by Governor Newsom. And that was a uh, on behalf of Bishop Arthur Hodges and South Bay United Pentecostal Church. And it, it kind of made its way up the courts pretty quickly. We filed it in May and we got all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court uh, later that month. Unfortunately, the ruling back then wasn't good. Justice Roberts sided with the, the liberal justices and we got a five to four decision not to grant injunct injunctive relief. And as, as Chris mentioned, since then, we've had a new justice appointed to the Supreme Court, thank God. And she uh, was the turning vote in this Brooklyn Diocese case. Uh, which really changed the analysis and simplified it. And as I like to use a, a phrase that Chris coined to summarize the ruling, if it's okay for Costco, it's okay for churches. I mean, it's that simple of a principle, but courts all across the country were getting it wrong. So fortunately we do have that Supreme Court uh, ruling now, and we were able to get a big win as Chris mentioned in the, uh, for Father Burfitt in California, but we still need to, uh, we still need a ruling on behalf of, um, you know, basically an injunction that would apply nationwide. So we're looking for the equivalent of the Brooklyn Diocese case for California. We do have some exciting news. We just, um, after making its way up through the, the lower courts again in the South Bay case, unfortunately we had an, a, a, a judge appointed by President Obama who, who denied the request for an injunction and the Ninth Circuit not surprisingly did as well. The rationale is completely faulty. It basically adopts the minority view of the dissenting uh, justices at the Supreme Court, which focuses on some pseudoscientific transmission risk test, which basically says, just trust us. We, we're just telling you churches are more dangerous than grocery stores, which is right. which is a laughable principle. So we're, we're quite confident that they're gonna get um, reversed by the Supreme Court. Actually, the Supreme Court's already requested a response from the government, uh, the state of California tomorrow. We're, we're asking for injunctive relief by this Sunday. 
and uh, there's a good chance we'll get a ruling this weekend or sometime very soon. So we're excited about that. We've also been actively involved in a case on behalf of Pastor John MacArthur in California. We've got some very big wins for him. And as you know, or as many people probably have heard, churches in Los Angeles County are now open, thank God, uh, largely as a result of these wins and, and the Father Burfitt win and um, you know the Supreme Court uh, win. So even though the state of California is closing churches, uh, L.A. County has, has kind of, uh, you know, basically gotten the message at this point and, they, and they've at least modified their orders. So uh, we also have, um, you know, a number of other cases here for the Thomas More Society on the West Coast where they were actively involved in a number of litigations. But that's kind of the most exciting thing right now is we're waiting for this big decision uh, from the Supreme Court of California. Very good. Thank you so much for sharing, Paul. Um, We've got about four minutes left, and I'm actually determined to end this on time because I never end anything on time. Just ask my husband um, <laughs> or start anything on time. Um, one of the big questions, one of the things that's weighing on everyone's hearts is it, with this change of administration, you know, we just went from what may rightly be termed the most pro-life administration that we've had in our history. Uh, President Trump, Vice President Pence, they probably, rightly so, were a dream uh, for the pro-life movement. And now the pendulum has swung. Uh, and I think it's probably right to say we're now facing the most pro-abortion administration that we have ever seen, uh, an administration that's going to challenge our work on the front lines at every turn. Um, I'd love to hear from, maybe we'll start with uh, Tom. Um, so maybe we'll go one minute each. Um, what can we expect and why uh, do we have hope in the midst of, you know, this battle that is very quickly heating up? So Tom will go Andy, uh, Chris, and then end with Paul. So what would you say to that, Tom? Well, uh, quickly, Lauren, thank you. I, the lesson of uh, Joe Scheiber is uh, what's important. Somebody is calling me up. <laughs> uh, you know, against adversity, uh, you simply persevere. Uh, the Bush administration argued against us in the Supreme Court on the substance of the uh, Scheider appeal, uh, and we won without their help, despite their opposition. So, you know, yes, uh, we may face adversity, but uh, uh, we've got a, a, a pro-life majority on the U.S. Supreme Court. We've launched an attack on Roe v. Wade already in and, and New York State, uh, and... Uh, Let's hang in there and let's uh, increase, not decrease, our energy uh, for the sanctity of life. Awesome. All right, Andy, one minute or less. What you got? Well, Lauren, I think with this new administration in place, we are uh, going to face an onslaught of new regulations that are hostile to our issues. And with the Obama administration, uh, you know, the Little Sisters of the Poor were persecuted by regulation passed by an administrative agency and so i think we're going to find hostile um, regulations passed by the administrative state um, in the obama years we not only think regulations but people which have some hurdles to, to uh clear before they're imposed on people but for the regulatory guidance that was that was published uh sometimes came out in press releases that statutes that have been in place for years are being reinterpreted by the regulatory agencies and uh, I think we're going to see a lot of litigation challenging that sort of lawlessness. And with our society, at this moment in time, I think we are being called to greatness because we are going to be busier than we've ever been. Mm, uh, so I think that we are open for business. Call us, and we are going to be there for you. Love it. Thank you. Uh, Chris, what would you say to that? I'm thinking of something that the late great Justice Scalia said, that when it comes to pro-life speech, suddenly it seems we have an abridged version of the First Amendment. And that's the problem we face. Uh, there's an anecdote that circulates among us when you do these pro-life cases about a young lawyer who tried a pro-life case, got a completely ridiculous result, contrary to all existing First Amendment law. And a more experienced colleague said to him, welcome to the pro-life bar. <laughs> So this is what we're facing. It's a daunting task. Somebody has to do it, and we're here to do it by the grace of God. Awesome. Thank you. Paul, close yeah, it out. I, it, I think it's a great blessing that we have Justice Baird on the Supreme Court right now, and, and um, it's an honor to be working with the Thomas More Society. We have so much important work 
I think that if the administration pushes this, pushes regulations too far, I think we'll see backfire in, in future elections. And I think that, you know, the devil always overplays his hand and we're, we're here to help fight the battle. I think I'm, I'm kind of excited that the Democrat Party and, and, and people are more interested in science now. So they say with all these lockdown orders, if they want to really look at the science, uh, you know, you know, the pro-life position's clear. It's based in science. And I think if we're going to if they want to be the party of the science now, I think that's that's good news for us. So. Yeah. And Abby Johnson, the, the first hour uh, gave us a, a special word that has really been rolling around in her head and heart, uh, even in the midst of this change of administration. And that is the word hope. And I remember during the Obama administration, you know, someone who was already getting into full time grassroots pro-life work, even as an attorney um, and remembering that each year, year after year, they were announcing record numbers of abortion facilities shutting down. And she reflected on how our ground game uh, really is our strength. And we do some of our best work when we're swimming upstream, right? And then we have you all to defend us as we are executing that ground game. And I, I just in closing here real quick, wanna share a, a quick story um, as a client of the Thomas More Society, and then I'm gonna pass it to Royce to close us out with a, a word of prayer, uh, unless you wanna pass that baton back and I'm happy to pray for us, Royce. But um, we, uh, you know, you all have defended our uh, peaceful sidewalk counselors for years. And one of my favorite stories comes from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, our valiant leader there, uh, Sarah, who's also a life runner, Dr. Pat Castle will love to hear that. Um, she's at the last remaining abortion facility in the state, this Planned Parenthood. I don't know why this thing is still open. Uh, we've heard through the grapevine Planned Parenthood is funneling tons of money there. So they don't announce that as really the first abortion free state. But anyway, Sarah and her crew are out there uh, day in and day out. And there was a female lieutenant who was passing by the abortion facility, and she told Sarah that she could no longer hand out uh, something called a blessing bag. So these are these beautiful gift bags that we put together for mothers in crisis, letting them know the resources, the options um, that they have available to them in the community, giving them little things to kind of break the ice and, and let them know, bottom line, that we care and that we can help. So this lieutenant told her uh, the reason you're not allowed to pass them out is because people are stopping, pausing in the driveway. And of course, she's on public right of way and they're taking them. Lord forbid she exercised her First Amendment right to hand out life saving literature and this small token of love to these mothers in crisis. And so Sarah called uh, our attorneys here at the Thomas More Society. Uh, we work very closely, uh, usually first with Martin Cannon on your team. And Martin made a friendly phone call into the local police department and uh, gave them a little First Amendment primer and ensured that Sarah's uh, rights were restored the very next time that she went out to the sidewalk. And the next shift that Sarah took, she was able to hand out her blessing bags and she helped save a pair of twins. And I've got dozens upon dozens of stories like that where you all have defended uh, our First Amendment rights and the rights of so many. Um, you know, we talked about the godfather of peaceful pro-life activism, Joe Scheidler, uh, who went home to the Lord here on Martin Luther King Jr. Day, um, starting with him all the way now down to this new generation of sidewalk counselors, prayer warriors, uh, undercover investigative journalists, and so many others. And so I just want to thank you all from the bottom of my heart, from one attorney to another group of attorneys who's not actually practicing law, but I'm in deep admiration of how you have taken the gift of your legal education um, obviously, you're much smarter than I am, and uh, I am encouraged knowing that you are defending our rights on the on the front line. So, thank you, gentlemen. We we deeply appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, absolutely. I appreciate you. Keep it going. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Royce. Do you want to go ahead and uh, close you. us out? Lauren, yeah. I, Lauren, I'm having technical issues on my end, so I'm going to turn it back to you. I just want to thank everybody for coming. And uh, it's been great. April 22nd will be the next Law of Life Summit. And I would encourage everybody to visit thomasmoresociety.org. The last thing I'll say is we'll make sure um, everybody that joined today knows about the, uh, the Now V. Scheidler documentary that will be coming out, I believe, February 28th. So we'll have a big announcement on that soon. Lauren, Andy, Tom, uh, guys, thank you so much. And, uh, and, and Chris and Paul, thank you. Lauren, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to close us out.
Yeah, absolutely. And Royce, uh, we're getting a lot of questions about a recording. Are we sending out a recording after this? Do you know? I'm going to check and see. We've had a few glitches where the system crashed today. I'm hoping that preserved the recording and didn't disrupt it. As soon as we get off, I will check and see if we have a recording and um, I'll send an email out to everybody that joined today. Okay, very good. Yeah. Well, I have the pleasure, the blessing of leading a cross-denominational ministry, uh, even though I happen to be Catholic myself. So um, let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer, if you all would join me. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, we praise you and thank you for who you are, uh, the author of life. We know, God, that you are good and that your desire be that um, every human life uh, be blessed and uh, be allowed to flourish uh, here on earth. Um, that we uphold this in the rule of law. I thank you for the warriors who are working on both fronts of law and culture. And Lord, I just ask your blessing upon the Thomas More Society today, all of their cases. We pray for wins. We pray for success, Lord, for your glory. We ask a special blessing upon David Delighton and thank you for his perseverance, his example, and the attorneys who are defending him. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would go before them in every argument, in every case, and uh, help see them through to victory. Uh, we also pray for those who are engaged uh, in the ground game, who are working on the grassroots level to affect change, uh, to to impact hearts and minds. So we know, Lord, that when we do that, that we often see a difference in the voting booth and that these things, one pours into the other. Um, so, Lord, we turn over uh, to you all of our plans, uh, all of the steps ahead of us. Uh, and we know that you will are good and that you will uh, that every life uh, be cherished and celebrated. We thank you, Lord, that we can be a small part of what you are doing to save lives and end abortion in America and beyond. It's in your most holy and precious name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, everyone. If we have a recording, uh, Royce will be sending that out via the Law of Life, Law of Life listserv. Uh, and until then, look forward to the next time we gather on April 22nd uh, for the next Smaller Li Law of Life Summit. Thank you all so much for being with us. Thank you, gentlemen. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.